Hello, it's Rhonda Thomas, and we're getting ready to do Financial Accounting Chapter 5's coursework. Um, let's get started. I'll share my screen. I have an Excel spreadsheet open, and um, I have the problem open. Okay, so this chapter is Chapter 5. Um, hopefully, you've already looked at the intro videos for this chapter that explains a lot of what we're doing. But in this chapter, we are adding product, okay? We are adding product. We're going to sell product um, instead of just being a service, all right? So there are going to be some new accounts involved. I am in the ebook, and I just want to see, ah, here it is. So here are some new accounts that you're going to have to get used to. We've got two new, I'm just going over those again. We've got two new accounts in assets. One's called inventory and one's called estimated returns inventory. There's two new liabilities, customer refunds payable, estimated coupons payable. There is a sales account now instead of just fees earned. We have a cost of goods sold account. We have a delivery expense, okay? So please keep in mind, we've added some accounts to the chart of accounts, all right? So I did want to show you that. And then I've also, in, on my spreadsheet here, I have a pretty good list of entries that are good to have at the ready in case you need them. And this is found in the ebook also. So each time we do a transaction, we are going to ask ourselves, are we the buyer or the seller? Okay, buyer or the seller. So that's very important um, because it all boils down to different accounting. And this is in the ebook. I'm trying to see if. So if you wanted to, and I've also included, oh, I know, I have included this in the module. So if you'll go to Canvas, Butler Canvas, scroll down to Chapter 5 module, I have included this sheet. It's called Buyer and Seller Journal Entries PDF. So you could keep this open if you wanted to or print it, okay? And once again, the seller is on the left, the buyer is on the right. This is describing several different transactions and how they came up with the numbers to do that. If you'll notice, sellers have more complicated entries than buyers, all right? So having said that, let's jump in to Cengage. At least I hope so. Hmm. Okay, whoop, hold on, hold on. Uh, it took me to... All right, here I am, here I am. Okay, so this is five dash four. This is a, an, a logarithm problem, okay? What that means is my set of numbers here is going to be different than your set of numbers, okay? So if you'll follow along with how I do it, uh, be sure to use your numbers or you will not come up with the right answer. So we have an Excel spreadsheet, which we'll open here in a minute, but this is a purchase related transaction. So let's go ahead and identify purchase. That is going to be from the buyer's point of view. Okay. So um, when we purchase something, here is inventory going up, accounts payable going up. That's if we purchase it on account. Okay, so notice, so we're going to do that. So mine says the stationary company purchased merchandise on account from a supplier for $7,100. Now you need to learn terms. Terms are stated as the discount first. And then, so the discount is we get a 1% discount off the invoice if we pay it within 10 days. If we wait for the 30 days, it's just the whole invoice. Then uh, the stationary company returned merchandise with an invoice amount of 900 and received full credit. 
This information has been collected in the Excel online spreadsheet. Open the spreadsheet and perform the required analysis and input your answers. So I went ahead and started a little, um, I call this a little form. And I'm going to put this in, whoops, oops, oops. I'm going to put this in, so hang on just a second. I'm going to put this in a square. So anytime we need to calculate an invoice, here's the things you need to figure out. All right, uh, calculating an invoice. Let me, and then if we find one, we can just use it. So invoice payment calculation. And this is from either side either the buyer or the seller. Okay, so we'll put a box around this, and then if we need to use it, we'll just copy it and paste it and bring it down. All right, so here's what we've got. You list your total invoice first. Then, assuming that you return it before you pay anything on the invoice, Okay, um, so here's what it's going to look like in T account analysis. And once again, we are the buyer. Um, I'll make the buyer a color so it catches our eye maybe a little better. What color do we want for buyer? Um, how about blue for buyer? Um, I guess I really don't have an S color. I can't... Um, so let's do blue for buyer. Okay. And then we'll come up with something for seller when we get there. All right. So initially, when we bought this, we are buying $7,100 worth of inventory on account. So that's the entry to do that. Then we decided some of the inventory needed to go back or return to the seller. And this is something we have to Consider now that we have product. So 900 comes out of inventory and it also comes out of accounts payable. All right. And we're going to calculate this invoice payment based on the understanding that this return happened before we made any payment whatsoever. So does this invoice have discounts? The answer is yes. It has a one in 10 Okay, so I suggest you put the percentage down that is offered, okay? But then you've got to figure out if 1% is being discounted from the invoice, how much are we really going to pay? So um, if it's 1%, then you're actually going to pay 99% of the invoice. Hope you understand that. So the percentage is one minus what one minus the percentage of payment is going to be 99% of the invoice. So one is the discount. Now I went ahead and figured the discount amount here. Okay. And I just realized I needed to change my border here. All right, so now I need another one. Um, okay, so you say, how'd you know that's the discount? Well, 1% of 6,200 is 62, and uh, I'm gonna pay 99%, or they're gonna pay 99% because they're gonna take advantage of the discount within 10 days of 6,200. So that is the amount that will be paid. So that goes down in cash, okay? Um, if sometimes you don't know if you're gonna make it by the by within the discount period. So you record it uh, as full amount, unless they tell you different. And then when the cash went down, we needed to make all of accounts payable go down. And then the cost of the merchandise, right? So we get to subtract 6,200 now. So now when you look at the balance in merchandise inventory, 
you should see that it's worth 6,138. 6,138. So I'm going to put uh, a balance here. So I'm going to subtract both of these and see if that is correct. Yes, it is. Okay. So that's how much the inventory is worth that matches what we're paying. Okay. So I am going to put that down. Now let's go to, and we're going to be using, there's two different kinds of inventory systems. There's perpetual and periodic. We'll do another chapter with inventory. This is just to tip our toe in the water, but we're gonna use perpetual inventory a lot more than periodic. So perpetual inventory is the inventory system in which purchase each purchase and sale of merchandise is recorded in an inventory account. So just like we bought something, right? When we bought it originally, we made it go up. When we're returning it, we're making it go down. When we took advantage of the discount, we're making it go down, okay? Now let's feed this into this spreadsheet. So now that you've hopefully analyzed your problem, here's the formula you'll want to use. So the amount to be paid is the purchase minus the return and then that whole amount right times 99 percent all right times 99 percent there it is okay there is how you do it now if you don't understand that 99 percent you could do this times one minus so minus 0 0.01, close parentheses, okay? So that's going to get your 99, and you still get the same answer, okay? So it doesn't matter to me whatever you do, all right? Let's close this one up. And once again, this is an algorithm problem, so you're going to have different information up here, but hopefully you can put in what you need on a piece of paper about everything we have up here, okay? Okay, this next one is going to be uh, five, let me look at a five, eight, five, eight, and this is not an algorithm problem. So let me take that out. We are going to do some more purchase relating transactions. Um, we're gonna do some journal entries. So I've got our invoices for our purchases that were being made. And this is again, the, from the buyer's point of view. So the first one is, um, we are Lily Heating and Air Company. We purchased 36,000, which I have right here, on account from Shell, terms one and 10 and N and 30. Okay, so. Um, here it is in the T account. So merchandise inventory goes up and accounts payable goes up for A. All right, so let's put that in. Inventory and accounts payable there and there. Okay, then we paid the amount owed on the invoice within the discount period. So we didn't return anything yet. So if you go up here, 1% uh, because one in 10, so 1% is the discount, which means we're going to pay 99% of the invoice. So 99% of 36,000 is 35,640. Now, our accounts payable has 36,000 in it. We've got to make that go away. So 36,000 goes in as a debit. We are sending the cash for the payment of the invoice, but without this extra, we don't balance. So we need a credit on this side, which is right here. And when you think about it, if you get a discount on inventory, then you need to reduce the value of that inventory based on what you paid for it, all right? So this is paying the invoice within the discounted period, okay? 
Now, we discovered that merchandise with an invoice amount of 9,000 purchased in A was defective and returned items receiving credit. So this is after we've paid the invoice that we found uh, items are defective. Okay, so we've already paid for it. So since we've already paid for it, and since we used a discount, we have to calculate the discount on what we're returning also. So up here in Excel, we are returning $9,000. So yes, uh, a return makes inventory go down because we're sending product back and we're going to debit that accounts payable. Now this is an unusual balance in here. But let's go ahead and figure out how much that is. So if we're returning 9,000 that we already paid a discount on, then we have to calculate the discounted amount that this should be. So our inventory that's gone back worth 9,000 is really 89.10 to us. So we're gonna make inventory go down with a credit of 89.10, which is what I have here. And then we debit accounts payable. Now, we already paid for this, right? So this is going to sit here with a debit abnormal balance, a debit abnormal balance, which means that that company actually owes us a refund for that amount, okay? But before we can get a hold of them, um, we're going to make another purchase. So here we are in, this is D. So let me label this correctly. This is D. This invoice or this, this purchase is $5,000 and it's in and 30. So no discount gets calculated on this. So it's just like the one above. Um, inventory is going to go up 5,000 right here. And accounts receipt accounts payable gets a credit for what we owe, right? And remember, this had an abnormal balance in there. So inventory gets debited, accounts payable gets credited. And now it's time for the company. Let's see here. Oh, the shell company is going to send us a refund. But remember. We had a credit of 89.10, but we made another purchase, right? So we might as well subtract that purchase from what they owe us because they will. So here is the new balance in accounts payable. Yes, it's on the wrong side, but it's indicating that we need a refund, okay? So this is the amount that we will be refunded so cash goes up right here for E and accounts payable gets credited, which makes the account balance in here zero, right? Zero. Now this is the side that it normally has a balance, right? So if you take this minus this, and then this amount was our return. And then we bought some more real quick. Because if we wouldn't have bought some more, they would have had to spend, send us a check for 89.10. And then we would have uh, credited this account. But we bought something in between, which made the refund less. So we don't have to pay for this now because we had credit. And then here's the amount in accounts payable so that we would know how much cash we are to get back as a refund. Okay. So that is that one, all right? Okay, um, we're ready for number three now. And um, this is determining amounts to be paid on an invoice. So there's about three or four things that you have to pay attention to on an invoice, whether you're a buyer or a seller, okay? And the buyer needs to understand how much they owe and the seller needs to be able to expect a certain amount. So they both should be able to calculate 
the same amount the same amount to pay an invoice. Now, invoices require freight terms. All right, so let me explain these freight terms as best as I can, as best as I can. Um, the most common one is FOB shipping point. That means that the buyer pays the shipping. Okay, this is the most popular. And actually, where the reason this is called FOB shipping point is the freight, once it leaves the seller's dock, the shipping point, it becomes property of the buyer, that freight, whatever is in the truck. So once that truck leaves the shipping point, that title passes to that buyer, and that's why they pay the shipping, okay? When a buyer pays the shipping, they include that amount in inventory, right? So let me make sure you know this, and then we'll go through the one for the seller. So FOB shipping point is buyer pays shipping. Buying pays freight, freight cost, all right, and includes the um, includes freight in inventory, okay? Freight in inventory, because however much it takes, inventory account, because however much it takes to transport inventory to us, that goes in that inventory account because uh, accounting, however much it takes to get where we could sell that inventory, um, if we have to pay tax, if we have to pay freight, whatever the situation is, that all goes in the inventory account, all right? So I'm going to color that blue to help you think about that. And then the opposite is true. Okay, so if we make one for the seller, and I decided to make the seller purple. Okay, so I like these two colors. All right, so if it says FOB destination, that is when the, the seller pays the shipping. FOB destination, seller pays freight. Now that doesn't happen very often. The buyer pays the freight most of the time. But if the seller truly does pay the freight, the freight includes the freight in an account called uh, delivery expense. Delivery expense. Okay, so we want to make sure you know that. Right, so that's what happens. And same with when the title passed to the buyer at the shipping point, if the freight terms are FOB destination, then the seller main, remain, uh, maintains the title of the freight until it gets to its destination. So uh, shipping point and destination is describing where the title of the goods pass. Okay, title of the goods pass. All right, so let's throw together. We're going to use our little template here for an invoice. So we're going to do one of these at a time, and they're all separate. All right, so the first one is the merchandise invoice amount. It's 32000 Then I would check to see, did we return, did, was anything returned? Now, this is really not from the buyer or the seller's point of view. It's from both. Okay, and that's why I put buyer and seller both. So the first one, we are returning $1,600. And you're to assume that the returns happen before the invoice payment. So is there a discount here on this one? The answer is no. All you have, the only choice you have, the only choice that's available to pay that is you have to pay the whole thing in 30 days. Now, what are the freight terms? The freight term of the first one is FOB destination, and that means the seller pays. 
So I put zero as the discount. So we're gonna pay 100% of the invoice. There was a return, but when we get down here and it says freight, um, we say it's, and then it says freight question mark, FOB destination question mark, and the answer is no. Okay, so nope, it's not FOB destination. So we have to, um, there, I wanted to do that. So there is no freight, all right? And if they don't list something, right, we can't make it up. So the very first one is $30,400, and that's why that's in there. Okay, let's go to the second one. The total invoice for the second one, 12800 we had a return of 2500 that left us with 10300 it has a 2 percent um, discount which means we're going to pay 98 percent of the bill there's that discount amount if we needed it for something right is there freight listed yes what are the terms? FOB shipping point. That means the buyer pays. If the answer is yes, you put the amount of the freight. So the freight is now included in this calculation. So I took 98% of the invoice after the return and I added the freight amount. You say, but it says freight paid by seller. Yes, a lot of the times the the seller will pay the freight when it leaves their dock, uh, but they will include it on the invoice for the buyer, okay? So either way, they end up paying for it. All right, so let's keep, keep working here. All right, so this one is 10,394, okay? C, C's total is 21,000. We had a return of 4,000, which left us with 17,000. Is there a discount? Yes, 1%. So we're gonna pay 99% of the invoice, leaving a discount amount of 170. Is there freight? Yes, it's FOB shipping point. That means the buyer pays. Did they give us an amount? The answer is no. So I put a zero in here, even though you really can't see it. And then this gets added to the bill, which for whatever reasons, the seller didn't tell us what the freight was. So we can't make it up, right? We can't guess at how much it would be. So that invoice is 16830 Okay, here comes the fourth invoice. The fourth invoice has a total merchandise inventory invoice amount of nine thousand dollars a thousand was returned leaving us with eight thousand there is a two percent discount which means we're going to pay 98 per, or the, the invoice is going to pay it be paid at 98 percent within the discount period there's that discounted amount the, is there freight the answer is yes is it fob shipping point the answer is yes so we include it so here is the amount of the fourth okay so i saved this last one just to walk us through it okay and then we'll put it in so one more time the invoice total is seventy-seven thousand four hundred. there is no return okay no return there is a discount of one percent so the invoice will be paid at 99% within the discount period. So that's the amount of the discount. Is there freight? Well, everything that's shipped has freight. So is it FOB shipping point? The answer is no. So there is no freight added to the invoice. So this last invoice was FOB destination, right? FOB destination which means the seller will pay the shipping. And I hate to say this, but the buyer really doesn't care how much that shipping was. They just don't have to pay it, all right? So we're gonna put that amount, 76,626, and check our work, all right? So that's how that works. So it is worth 
putting together a little template, right? A little template. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, our fourth problem actually is from a seller's point of view. So we also need to understand that some sales require sales tax. Um, when a seller collects the sales tax, that's not their money. They need to house that money in an account until it's time to pay it. And most of the time you pay sales tax on a monthly basis, or maybe if you don't sell a whole lot that's taxable, you might pay it quarterly, but it's going to go to the governing, usually to the state uh, where the business is located or where the purchase was made, I'm sorry. So let me show you how this is gonna work. We've got six T accounts. We sold $640,000 of merchandise on account. If you see the words on account and you're a seller, you're allowing your customer to pay you later, right? So we need an accounts receivable. Now, I took the sales amount here, here's your sales, taxable sales, okay, taxable sales, okay, it's 640000 it's 7% sales tax, so that means we have to collect 44800 on top of the sales price, right? So if you add 640000 which is the sale, and the amount of 44,800, you add those together, you get a debit to accounts receivable of 684,800. You're going to credit the sales account with the actual sales amount, and then you're going to credit an account called sales tax payable, which is a liability for the amount of the sales tax you collected. Now, this is perpetual inventory. When we make a sale, every time we do, we are going to make our inventory go down by the amount they tell us. So the amount is called cost of goods sold. So inventory goes down and then the debit goes in cost of goods sold. So I've put that here. So here's making the inventory go down in a T account and Cost of goods sold is an expense. They have to tell you what it is right now because you don't know how to calculate that. And that's fine. All right. So this one, this is these are separate entries, but they go kind of together. Okay, they go together. So that's why, but we kept the sale up here and we kept the cost of goods here, right? So these are two entries that happen at the same time but we keep them separate as to the cost of goods sold. All right, so then it says we paid $61,750 to the state sales tax department for taxes collected. So I needed a cash account. So we're making cash go down by the amount they say. And when we pay sales tax, then it goes down. You say, well, wait a minute. We only have this much in here. Well, they probably have more in here um, that we just didn't know, we just didn't get the information on how much is in that account. So they must have had more than just this entry, all right? But when we sell, I'm sorry, when we pay, sorry, when we pay the sales tax, we have to have enough cash to do it. And then we make that sales tax payable go down. And then, uh, because like I said, when we put some in here, then eventually we've got to pay it on to the state where it goes, okay? It's not our money to keep. All right, so this was an example of a seller uh, entry, and we introduced you to the fact that when you make the sale, then you also have to reduce the inventory and record the cost of goods sold at the same time, all right? Very good, let's keep going. Okay. Now that we have quite a few more accounts and we have product, um, we are going to make an income statement 
And this is going to be based on the seller, right? And this is 532. So I want you to see an income statement and how different it looks now that we, so this is a multi-step income statement. Okay, it's going to be quite a bit longer than what you've seen in the past. And I have one to show you. Uh, anytime you have to create a financial statement, it's always good to go get a picture of one so you're not fighting whether you know it or not. So I have one down here somewhere. Here it is. So we're going to bring it up here as we put this together. So we may have to do a little calculating in this Excel file, but I'm not going to make the income statement on here. I'm going to put it into here. All right. Now, um, there are going to be things on here that we don't use. All right. So it's going to try to confuse you. All right. And so if it's not on here, then we don't want to pick it. All right. So the top of any income statement, no matter what's going on, is always going to start with sales. If you're looking at a list like this, notice this is in alphabetical order. And so there is not any help as to what goes on what financial statement. So here's what I would recommend. Once again, have an example to look at so that you can reference it. So it looks like we have sales, cost of goods sold, and then something called gross profit. If you're looking at this list, what's the largest value on this list? It's 8,245,000. Well, that just so happens to be sales. All right, so let's put our sales in there. That is not unusual. So if you get a list like this and you have to put together an income statement, then you might start thinking about, well, I wonder if the biggest amount on here is sales. So then the next biggest amount is the cost of goods sold. And if you hover over anything green in here, it'll give you a definition. All right, so the next item that we list is the cost of goods sold. And the cost of goods sold is 5,500,000. Okay, so what, what seems to happen here? Well, we didn't put it in as a negative, but we need to know that it gets subtracted. Okay, so um, we I'm not going to make you do the math. I'll help you do the math. No big deal. But you do need to understand by taking this class that the cost of goods sold will be subtracted from sales. And we're going to have this new subtotal called gross profit. Okay, gross profit. All right, so the new subtotal now is 2745000 once again, the point of an income statement is to say, here's how much we, here's how much revenue we brought in. Here's one, here's the biggest cost. So your biggest cost when you sell product tends to be the cost of the goods that you sold. Then you have a new subtotal called gross profit. So gross profit is not an account. It's a subtotal. Okay. So now let's see when we're looking at if this said operating expenses, like this one said, it would be nice. Now we're going to list our selling expenses. Okay, selling. It's just put together in one amount. So notice these selling expenses are listed out itemized, right? There's that delivery expense that I told you that a seller would use if they have to pay the shipping or freight cost, right? So all of these items are considered selling expenses and there's a total, but ours are totaled already. So let's put 575,000. And then the next category is called administrative expenses. And there it is for 435,000. Okay, and then we're gonna add these together right here where it says total expenses. So our total expenses are 
dollars. Okay, one million ten thousand dollars. That then, which is what you see here, gets subtracted from way up here, right? So this gets subtracted from here, and we're going to get something called operating income. So we're not quite ready to put net income yet. So we need another subtotal. So we're going to take these expenses and subtract them from gross profit. And our operating income is now $1,735,000. Now, we have one more item on here that goes on here. So let's just review these a minute. Accounts receivable is an asset. Asset is not reported on the income statement. Accumulated depreciation for the building is a contra asset. It's not reported on the income statement. We've already put administrative expenses. Building is an asset. Cash is an asset. Doesn't go. Common stock is an equity. Doesn't go on the income statement. We've already put in the cost of goods sold. Dividends are reported on the state stockholder's equity statement. So it doesn't go. Here is an interest expense. Okay, so we are have used... This is the last piece. So this interest expense gets put in, all right? And because it's an in expense, notice this says other revenue and expenses, other revenue and expenses. So if we had revenue, we would list it and then subtract uh, the interest expense. These are very specific, okay? So. There's really nothing to help you know if they go down here. It's something you have to learn. So our interest expense is 15,000 and we must know to subtract it. So now we're ready for net income. And when we are finished, we found out that we held on to, after we subtracted all our expenses, we held on to $1,720,000. All right, so now that we have more products and more revenue, then our income statement gets longer. And the more we can break it up into different areas or different categories, the more the better story it tells us where we spent our money, where the costs were, all right? So what's the major advantage of the multi-step over the uh, single step, right? The multi-step. It shows the relationship of gross profit to sales, okay? So that is a very important, and I put one too many zeros, sorry. That's a very important um, subtotal, this gross profit here, because Immediately when we subtract our cost of goods sold, then we know what's left over to cover all the other expenses, right? So I wanted to go ahead and finish coming on down here, right? So we, we left off with interest expense. I know we're done, but inventory is an asset. Notice notes payable. Payable is always a liability. This should say prepaid office supplies, but it doesn't. It doesn't say office expense, though. So the fact that it has the word supplies in there, you have to get used to the fact that's an asset. Retained earnings is an equity account. Salaries payable is a liability. Now, we've already used selling and sales. And then the last one is store supplies. That should say prepaid store supplies. <clears throat> okay, so that's an asset. So that is pretty much how something like this would go, but I think it helped, I believe. All of these should say expense, 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 expense. I like to put the word expense after every category of an expense. I like to put the word prepaid for any store supplies, any office supplies, any insurance, any prepaid rent, Anything that's considered a prepaid expense, I think needs the word prepaid so no one is confused, okay? But it happens. All right, we have two bigger ones to do. 
All right. Okay, we are ready to take on our big problem. I am going to read these so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down, okay? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I've got 12 accounts. We're gonna go through each transaction. You have to use the appropriate you have to use the account name exactly, or it won't take it. Here is our journal, all right? And our very first date is November 3rd. So I'm gonna read it. And then we're gonna look at how things are calculated. So November 3rd, purchase merchandise on account from Moonlight. The list price is 85. So when we buy something, we are the buyer. Okay, so here it is um, from Moonlight. Moonlight's account is right here. And by the way, every vendor that we have has its own AP account, just like every customer that we have has its own AR account. Now, you haven't seen that yet, but you're about to. Okay, you're about to. So here we go. So once again, our invoice is 85000 there's a trade discount. Now, we haven't gone over trade discounts, but it just means how much it's off uh according, you know, to make it sound make the make the sales price seem better. All right? So here is 75% of of the invoice. So here is with the 25% off, all right? So 63,750. So we're going to make inventory go up for 63,750. And we're gonna make AP Moonlight credit for 63,750. So I'm gonna color these as we enter them so that we know that we have used it, okay? And tie it to the right one, okay? Um, so, there's the first one. So let's type in, um, and we need to know what the inventory account is called. It's just inventory. All right. So you can type it or you can inventory 63,750. And we want accounts payable moonlight. So here it is. I'm going to highlight it and copy and paste. Okay and 63,750, that's our first entry, okay? I'm gonna read it one more time. Purchase merchandise on account from Moonlight. I need to finish reading these before I go any further. So let's do it. Purchase merchandise on account from Moonlight. The list price was 85, so I really need to say list price. List price was 85, there's a 25% trade discount. The terms are FOB destination, right? FOB destination and two and 10 or net in 30. So we're not quite ready to do our discount yet, um, but we are ready to put in this amount here. Okay, so this amount is what has happened. I have put in some more information as we go through our transactions that will apply, but here's what we want. We want that number to go in as these two here, and we have put that in. All right, we're now ready for November 4th, and I'm not going to do anything without reading it first. I have to force myself. So now the next one is sold merchandise for cash. 37680 The cost of the goods sold was 22600 Now this number, uh, November 4th, is for a seller. All right, now I did put buyer when there was a buyer, but this is a cash sale. So um, 
and they said that it was 37,680 is a cash sale. So we don't have to record who it's from. Okay. Doesn't matter. We would probably, but we don't have to in the accounting system. Now we go down here to sales. We credit sales for that amount. Remember, sales is a revenue account. Okay, I wanted to go ahead and put the kinds of accounts that are here, expense. This is an expense, you can already see it. Payable is a liability. So if you want to label your T accounts, that would be a good idea. Um, I want to label these as what kind of an account they are so that hopefully that helps you a little bit. I didn't put the debits and the credits in like I have in the past. This is an asset. Okay, yeah, this is an asset. Okay, so I think I did what I said I wouldn't do. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Let's do it again. Sold merchandise for cash, 37680 So up goes cash for 37680 Then we need to record a credit in sales for that. And then the cost of the goods that we sold is 22600 So it's going to need a debit to the cost of goods sold account. And then we need to make inventory go down by 22600 as well. So we have two entries here that kind of go together like peanut butter and jelly. So uh, cash is our debit and of 37680 Our sales gets the revenue, 37680 Our cost of goods sold gets a debit for cost of goods sold. Okay, let me see what cost of goods sold. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not sure. Let me just type, let me just type it in, put it here. Cost of goods sold. All right, there it is. 22,600. So once again, cost of goods sold. There it is, 22,600. And we need to make that inventory account go down 22,600. Okay, so we've just finished. November 4th. Okay, November 4th, we're ready for November 5th. Okay, so we'll go back to the top. Purchased merchandise on account from Papoose Creek Company. $47,500. The terms are FOB shipping point. It's 2 and 10 or N and 30 with prepaid freight of 810 added to the invoice. Okay, so this one is Moonlight. This is Papoose. Here is our AP account for Papoose. The invoice is, and we are the buyer on this one, so we're the buyer, it's FOB shipping point. We don't have a list price on this one. So the invoice is 47,500 and they have the seller that we're buying it from. I'm sorry, the, we're the buyer. The vendor that we're buying it from added the freight of 810 to our invoice. So we are going to record a uh, inventory of 48,310 and an accounts payable of 48,310. So up here, okay, so I'm gonna make green, that's the number, and it's gonna go in inventory because we're buying it. Remember, the freight goes in there too. And then we have an AP with Papoose. All right, so let's do inventory for 48,310 and we're going to go get accounts payable papoose so we don't misspell it for 
48,310. Okay, now we're ready for November 6th. November 6th is returned merchandise with the invoice amount of 13,500. This has to do with the purchase we made on November 3rd from Moonlight. All right, so let's try to refresh our memory here. Here is Moonlight. Here's how much we have in it so far. We're going to make a return now, right? We're going to make a return. So we need to do an entry to make this account go down, right? Mm -hmm. For that amount of the return. And then we also need to back out that amount in inventory. Now, you said, how come we aren't using the 2% and everything? Well, we did this return before the discount period, right? Remember, we bought it on the 3rd, and now it's the 6th. Now it's the 6th. So we this was before the discount period was over with. So we want a debit to AP Moonlight. So you should be able to just copy and paste it here. AP Moonlight for $13,500. And then our inventory uh, needs to go down by that amount as well, because um, it says that we returned merchandise. Doesn't say why, all right? So now we're down to this as our invoice, right? And if you look, aha, there is how much we owe AP Moonlight, okay? So, all right, we're ready for November 8th. November 8th, now we're selling to Quinn Company, $15,600 with the terms in and 15. So they need to pay the whole invoice within 15 days. The cost of the goods sold is $9,400. All right, so let's go to Accounts Payable Quinn. And there isn't any discount. And it doesn't say anything about freight. It doesn't say anything about FOB destination or shipping point or any of that stuff. So we're going to put a debit in. AR for Quinn, then we're going to put a credit in sales for the same amount, and then the cost of what we sold was $9,400, so then that one goes in there, and then down goes inventory, $9,400 for that one, all right? So these two are going to be the sale, so accounts receivable, Quinn is up here. Okay, and then the sales gets that amount. So this is 15,000. Gotta look, where is Quinn? Up here, $15,600. Sales is also $15,600. Then we have the cost of the goods that we sold, cost of goods sold. And then we have inventory going down. Okay, they said the cost is $9,400. So once again, we made cost of goods sold go down $9,400. Okay, so I can get rid of some of this, I think. But just in case, never know. All right, so a debit to not uh, cost of goods sold of 9400 Inventory, 9,400. We're ready for November 13th. November 13th is paid moonlight on account for purchase of November 3rd, less return of November 6th. So, okay, all right. So let's go back up to moonlight. Now it's time so this is how much we owe. We are paying it within the 10 days. So the new amount that we're gonna pay out in cash is 49,245, okay? All right, and then, so 
Let's take first things first. Let's go to their account. You'll see that we owe them $50,250. So here is the debit to make that AP go down. Okay. Now we are going to, so we're, we just use this one. Okay. So there's nothing left in this account now. Okay. There is zero in here. Then we are going to pay out in cash this. Okay, so that's going to be cash going down. So up here in the cash account is 49245 Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do this. Okay, and we are looking at let me just take these out. I'll put those in when we get finished. I knew that was a mistake to do that. So sorry I did. Okay, so November 13th, one more time. Paid Moonlight on account for purchase of November 3rd, less return of November 6th. So we need to make accounts payable Moonlight go down, and we haven't done it all yet, so it's all right. Accounts payable Moonlight is going to go down by with a debit of fifty thousand two fifty. We're going to pay out in cash forty nine thousand two forty five, and we're going to make inventory account go down by the amount of the discount. So I'm going to put the word discount here. That is that. So we have a debit with two credits for November 13th. So our debit is going to be to accounts payable, Moonlight. Okay, accounts payable, Moonlight. And once again, 50,250 is going down in that T account to get rid of that. Okay, now we're going to pay with cash we're paying $49,245 with cash. And then this is the amount to make inventory go down, right? Because we are taking advantage of the um, discount. And, but we didn't know we were until the time. Okay, so then we have inventory as our second credit of $1,005 in cash is $49,245. When you add these two together, it makes this debit. Okay, we are now ready for November 14th. Okay, November 14th, let's read it. November 14th, sold merchandise with a list price of 236,000 to customers who use Visa and who redeemed 8,000 of point of sale coupons. The cost of goods sold was $140,000. Okay, so when we are paid by credit cards, it's actually considered cash, yep. Okay, so it says that we sold merchandise with a list price of 236,000, so we want to show 200, uh, okay, 236,000. So I guess I do need uh, to record. Okay, so hang on, let me make this some more room in between here. All right, so this sale, all right, um, all right, so total sale. All right, was 236,000. But they had coupons, 236,000. They had coupons of 8,000. Okay, so here's how much we are going to record the sale. So uh, record sale. All right, so equals the total sale minus, all right, so record the sale of 228. So that is a credit to sales. 
Okay. And once again, this is a cash sale. So cash is, is going to go up 228. And this is also the cash. Okay. So they had coupons. Mm -hmm. So there's the credit. And the debit to cash is up above 228,000. Okay, so cash is going up for 228,000 and sales. And we would probably make a notation that this was with coupons, okay? But they're not having us put that in. All right, now we're at November 15th. Okay, November 15th, it says, paid papoose on account for purchase of November 5th. All right, so let's go down to Papoose and see what we have. Okay, we have 48,310. Okay, and we have already figured that 48,310. Okay, that's all right. So here's the invoice. Okay, here's the invoice. Here is the 2%. We're going to take the 2% off. This is what we recorded it the first time. Okay, this is what we recorded it the first time. Now we need to know how much cash we're going to pay. Okay, so this right here is going to be the cash. You can't discount the freight. All right, so here's our original invoice. 2%, 98% of our original invoice. Then we add the freight and then we pay the cash. So we're going to pay a cash payment of 47360 and a discount, which causes inventory to go down by that much. Okay, so we need to get rid of the AP to Papoose, right? There it is. So that's going to be a credit to pay them off. Then cash is going to go down. We're going to write them a check for $47,360. And then we're going to lower. Okay, let me look here. Hmm, where did that one come from? Just a minute. Did I skip? Oh, guess what I did? I did skip. Let's go back to November 14th. Sorry. When you make a sale, it doesn't matter whether it's cash or on account, you do need to record the cost. Cost of goods sold. So go back to the 14th. I apologize. The 14th, we need to debit cost of goods sold for 140,000 and we need to make inventory go down. 140,000. So there actually is another entry to help with the sale because every time we place a sale, then we need to reduce inventory because we're working with perpetual inventory. Okay, so that explained this one. Okay, there and there. Now we're ready for November 15th. Let's go back and read it again. November 15th, paid papoose on account for purchase of November 5th. So we're now ready to calculate how much in cash we have to pay. So here's the invoice. Here's 98% here's of it. Here is the freight that gets added together, and this is the cash. So cash gets debited for... 47,360, okay, 47,360, and that is 47,360. Then um, we need to I'm sorry. Boy, I'm not doing very well. Sorry about that. Let's see what we do. 
Cash is going to go down 47,360. There it is. It's a credit, not a debit. So then we need to debit Papoose's accounts payable. And then we need to make uh, inventory go down by the discount. So this is a discount also. Okay, so there you have it. So let's see if we can get this straight. So we want accounts payable papoose. Yep, because that's who we're paying. Accounts payable papoose gets the debit to make all of their accounts payable go away. It's gone. Now we're paying a credit of cash of 47,360 right there. And those don't balance. What it takes to balance is 950 and that is the discount. That discount comes out of inventory, okay? To better reflect the true cost that we paid. All right, I think we're finished. When you get to November 15th, hopefully you're on line 24. I'm going to see where we're at. Um, I think we have to do this whole thing before we get much of a grade, All right? So if we have something missing, uh, we'll fix it. All right, we are now on November... November 23rd. So let's put that in. November 23rd. It says received cash on account from sale of November 8th to Quinn. So we need to go back and look at Quinn. What does Quinn owe us? Quinn owes us $15,600. So cash is going to come in for $15,600. And we're going to make that accounts receivable go down to zero because this is now paid. So let's put cash in for 15,600 and we're going to use accounts receivable Quinn, which is right here, as the credit. Okay, as the credit. Okay, I believe that finishes us with 23. Now it's 24. November 24th, this is a sale, okay? This is a sale. So we need to remember that we will be putting two entries in here uh, because of a sale. So sold merchandise on account to Rabble. So here is Rabble, okay? It says that the terms are in and 30. So no discount, no freight, okay? And I have this on the wrong side. So let's put this over here. So 56,900 goes into accounts receivable. I just want to show it to you and then we'll put it in. Then we go down here to sales. It gets 56,900 as a credit. Okay. And then the cost of what we sold them was 34,000. So we have to debit the uh, cost of goods sold for 34000 and then we make inventory go down for that much. All right, so let's go through it again. We need accounts receivable um, Rabble. Okay, we're selling it to them on account. And we didn't have any discount or anything, so uh, it's just a... Uh, I call a straight invoice sale. So we have 56,900 here that goes in as a debit. 56,900. Then we need sales of that much, 56,900. Then we need November 24th again. Be sure to watch the numbers over here on the sides. Okay, that should help. Now we want cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold for that sale is 34,000 and inventory goes down by that amount, 34,000. Okay, so yeah, inventory is pretty busy 
in this scenario. Okay, now we're ready for November 28th. Let's put that in. It says that we're going to pay a visa service fee of $3,540. So we have a credit card expense account here. It's an expense, so its normal balance is a debit. So we're going to put this debit in, and we're going to pay it out of cash. Okay, out of cash. There it is. Okay, there it is. So um, we're going to credit card. All right, so let's just go up and look. Credit card expense account. It costs money to use a credit card in a business. What I mean by use a credit card, it means to accept a credit card as payment. It costs service fees for that to happen. Okay, so there is a certain extra amount of expense to be able to take a card. But if you don't take a card, you're going to lose a lot of sales. Okay, now we have... All right, so we are now ready... Or we have two number 30s, okay, two number 30s. So let's read this through. Now, this one's tough. Um, all right, so then it says, paid Quinn a cash refund of $6,000 for returned merchandise from sale of November 8th. The cost of the returned merchandise is $3,300. So when we pay cash to someone, cash goes down. So there it is. So that's a credit. That's one thing. This is a return. And when you, when you analyze a return and you're the seller, see this returns inventory, we need to find customer refunds payable. This is where the debit goes. You say, but this is the liability and I don't see anything on this side. I know this is something you're going to have to just work through. So we're going to debit customer refunds payable and credit cash, right? Because they brought us back. They brought us a return, okay? So let's do that one first. So let's use that customer refunds payable. So customer refunds payable. Luckily, they named it something that makes us think about a return or a refund. So a customer gets refunded $6,000 and we are sending them a check, okay? Now that we have that merchandise back, we have to debit the inventory account for the cost. And they said the cost of those items are $3,300. So we gotta, we've got to put it back in inventory. Okay, back in inventory. And then the credit goes to estimated returns inventory, okay? Estimated returns inventory. That's a hard one, okay? Estimated returns inventory. It's an asset, okay? And so it goes in here, 3,300. Okay, those two go together. Once again, we are refunding Quinn, $6,000, and instead of lowering sales, we want to keep track of how much we're refunding, right? And then inventory goes up for what they brought back, and then the offset to that goes in the estimated returns inventory. Okay, this last one, during November, printed a coupon with each customer's sales receipt for $2 off the next 
the customer's next purchase of over $15. The coupons may be redeemed during December. Of the total of 20,000 coupons printed, it's estimated that 55% will be redeemed. Okay, so this we need to, we have a coupons, estimated coupons payable here. And we need to understand the sale of this. So when we issue a, a coupon, right? It's basically causing our sales to go down. So I'm gonna put this here. So this is the coupon transaction. All right, so we are going to take 20, if we're going to make 20,000 coupons at $2 off, right? So number of coupons, this is, this can be kind of difficult. Number of coupons, 22, or 20,000, right? How much are the coupons worth? $2. So we want $2 and we want that as a dollar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to change it. All right. And then the estimate of how many they think are going to be redeemed. How many do we think are going to be redeemed? Redeemed percentage. So if we thought they were all going to be redeemed, then we would put 100%. Redeemed percentage is 55%. Okay, so I'm gonna change that to its percentage. All right, now we're going to calculate this. So here we go. I'll just, and this needs to be the percentage. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the math here. 20,000 times two times 50%, so equals. 20,000 times two, oops, times 55%. Okay, let me make sure that I did this right. Yep, 22,000 is the amount. This is the amount of the estimated coupon payable. So if we create coupons, we need estimated coupon payable. So we need to put it somewhere because we owe that, right? So um, let me put it here, see if it stays. Okay, so this is the estimated coupon payable. So we are going to put that in that coupon payable with a credit because we're actually creating a liability. So I'm going to put that down here. So let's go get estimated coupon payable. Okay, coupons actually become a liability to us um, because we're waiting to see if they're going to get used. Our estimate here could be way wrong. 22,000 is what we want. Now the offset goes to sales. Okay, so a coupon makes our sales go down, right? So we need to debit sales for that coupon, all right? So we need to go down here where sales is. There it is, and it is a debit. So let's put sales in for that one. So that one was tough, okay? Let's see if I can get it to grade now the way it should, and I'm hoping if we hold our breath, okay, I've got one here that I need to fix. So our credit card, see I did a transposition there. It should be 3540. So if you followed that, then you should have that error too. 3540. And I wanna make sure that I have that fixed. Thir see, I even have it and I didn't follow it. All right, let's see. We're at 93.21 out of 94. 
Let me redo it. Okay, so when I fix that amount, my journal entry, the journal here is now complete. The score is 475 out of 475 and the points are 94 out of 94. Okay, so that's what you're going to need to do. Watch your numbers on the sides. Okay, we have one more piece here. So this is going to be assume that as of December 31st, $10,400, I'm sorry, 10,400 of the $2 off coupons issued during November have been redeemed by customers. So once again, let's look at that estimated coupon payable, right? So if we want to calculate 10,400 is coupons redeemed, I think. So coupons redeemed. Ten thousand four hundred at two dollars a piece. How much is that? So ten thousand four hundred times two dollars each. Okay. Um. All right. Let me look here. Ten thousand four hundred of the two dollar. Okay. has been redeemed by customers. Okay, um, let me go back. Let me go back. So, how many did we say up here? Okay, redeem percentage 55%. Okay, and by the way, this is going to be December 31st. So December, I think, yeah, December 31st. Assume that as of December 31st, 10,400 of the $2 off coupons issued during November had been redeemed by the entry for the remaining, oh, 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 I think I'm missing something. So hang on, make it smaller so I can read it. This is, all right. Okay, so 10,400 of the $2 off coupons issued um, during November had been redeemed by customers. Journalize the entry for the remaining unredeemed coupons. Unredeemed, right? So, um, we need to go, go back down here again. So we thought, okay, so the redeemed amount ended up being different. Here's what we thought it was going to be. Okay, here's what we thought it was going to be. And Okay, so here's the amount. Okay, just a moment. Okay, we're still working on this coupon one. All right, so up here, right, um, we put this payable in thinking there would be 20,000 coupons at $2 a piece with only 55% being redeemed. All right, if you take 55%, so I'm going to move this. I'm going to move this. I'm going to put this $2 down here. So let's put that down here. Let's put our redeemed amount that we expect. So they expect 55% to be redeemed. This is where we needed to fix this, 55% redeemed, okay, so 55%, how many coupons would that be? So 20,000 times 
55%, there's 11,000 coupons that they expect to be redeemed. Coupons expected. All right, now we're going to do the math. So there's where we needed to see that amount. So this is going to equal 11,000 times $2. And there's where we get our $22,000. Okay, so this is $22,000. Now, how many coupons were expected to be redeemed? Remember, this is 11,000 coupons at $2 expected to be redeemed. Okay, so remember that. So the coupons, let's, let's see what, all right, what we expected, right? Coupons expected is 11,000, okay? How many actually were redeemed? So this is coupons expected to be redeemed. That was the 11,000 that we found up here. Okay, so I'm going to give us a little more room here. Insert. This is tough. All right, so then actual coupons redeemed. How many? Redeemed. All right, it said that it was actually 10,400. Okay, actual coup coupons redeemed. So we missed it by what, $600? So remaining coupons, okay, remaining coupons, but they're not good anymore. So remaining coupons is 600. And how much are they worth? $2. So we need to make an adjustment to this coupons payable. We thought it was going to be this much, but it really turned out to be 10400 So we put too much in this payable based on our estimate. Okay, so this is $2 here. And so the amount that needs to be adjusted out of that coupon account is twelve hundred dollars. So six six hundred times two is twelve hundred dollars. So there's where I'm getting this twelve hundred dollars, and the offset goes to sales because when we put this payable in here, we made sales go down. So now that we're going to get rid of that payable, the coupon's done. Coupons done, but we estimated a little too much. And now we need to show 1200 going back into sales because we took it out here for the coupons, but we get we estimated too much. So what we want is a debit to estimated coupons payable and a credit to sales. So let's put sales in 1200. Okay, and then the estimated coupon payable goes down. I know that is very difficult, and I'm sorry that it is so hard. Even, even me, I had to think about it a little bit. I was having troubles figuring out where they got, how they figured out 11,000 coupons. So this was the coupons expected to be redeemed. I didn't break it down here, I just did the math to get to 12, 22,000, right? So sometimes it's important to find out certain pieces of all of this. So now let's try it and see if we've got it. I think we do, and I'm sorry this has taken so long. So, all right, the next one, we're gonna put together uh, a big set of income statement, a big set of financial statements which will involve the income statement. So let's start with the income statement first, and I'm gonna stack. So here is our list of accounts to use. 
we're going to feed all of these in to the financial statement that they belong to. All right. So I think it would be helpful to have one, which I have. So let me go get a copy of this one and bring it to. Um, actually, we'll just go back. So we'll go back to this now. And this is going to be problem. 5A, I believe, problem 5A, we're going to put together three financial statements. So please stay with me. Stop it if you need to. I'm going to go pretty quickly here so we can get through it. All right. So once again, this is what an income statement would look like pretty much. So we're going to use that as an example. I've got the stockholders equity statement for an example and a balance sheet for an example. So it's definitely worth getting one of these in front of your face so that you're not struggling so much. You're not expected to know this. Just there's no intuition that's going to help you necessarily know what these look like, all right? So I'm gonna go pretty fast. Um, a income statement, now by the way, this is the Claremont Company, fiscal year ending May 31st of year two. So if we're gonna to put together a multi-step income statement, we're gonna to need to put for the year ended May 31st at the top, okay? That is at the top. Okay, so we are only going to pull out the items that go on an income statement. Well, the top of any income statement starts with its sales. So I'm going to read it to you, okay? Um, it would be wise, well, let me see here. Let me get, if I could get this total here, just a minute. Uh, we could see this. I can I can do this as a snip, I believe. Okay, let me go one down one more. Okay, so I'm going to do this as a snip so we can see it. Okay, the new snip. Here are all our accounts that we're going to work with. And I'm going to put this in here to look at. So we don't have to scroll up and down so much, okay? Up and down so much. So while this is really important to know that this is the multi-step income statement, we need to know our amounts. So here we go, okay? Now, if it were me and I have one, I have a copy of this. So after, if it were me, I would go print this from the ebook, right? You can print this from the ebook or you can paste, you can you can copy and paste. I think I also have the ebook open. Let me see. So this problem is in the ebook, right? So um, let me go find it. This is problem series A and you could go to multi-step income statement, okay? So I do think that I am going to get rid of this one and do this one, okay? This one, I will snip also new. So usually if I have a an in-class, um, if I have, if my class meets face to face, I usually, I got to do this again. I usually give them a copy of something like this so they have it. And that's why having the book is so important. Um, I wouldn't want to try to do any of this without the book. So there, I think I can get all of this on here. All right, so I'll, you'll just have to know this is 5A. Notice I have a check answer down here. 
Got a little more information here. So I'm going to snip this again and bring it over here into my Excel. And hopefully this will help us. And I'll try to not take so long. But um, I know how detailed this is. And we're not really very good at details. This time, this, the, this day and age, we're not very good with details. Details are very uh, hard to stick, keep your attention, all right? So we're making this income statement. We said sales. So I said that when you get a list like this, now the good thing about this list, everyone, is you could draw a line right here. In fact, um, I'll do this. Let me do this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a new snip of this. And when I do, I'm going to highlight where I'm talking about. So snip. Yep. I'm going to highlight on here. Here's where the division line is. Now they have done you a big favor on this one. So that's good. Okay, now I'm going to bring that into my Excel spreadsheet. And now you can see where the division line is. So everything from cash to dividends um, we'll use on the balance sheet and the stockholders equity statement. So anything from sales down is going on the income statement. So they did you a, uh, they did you a solid here. So cost of goods sold. Okay, and you can put amounts in. So let's start putting in amounts. Our sales is 11,343,000. Cost of goods, right, is 7,850,000. Okay, so now we have something called gross margin. Gross margin is up here under either a label or an account description. There it is. I'm sorry, gross profit. Gross profit, so just type in gross profit. Okay, and I didn't spell it right, so it didn't like it. There we go. So our gross profit, and I'm not going to make you do any math, is 3,493,000. If you can get through putting this together, you're going to see how these income statements go. So then here we are with our um, multi-step income statement as our example. So what comes next? Probably the label operating expenses, selling and admin. So let's put those two, let's put those three labels in. So let's go get operating expenses and it goes in. Then you need selling and admin. Okay, so they're a label also. The nice thing uh, about putting these together is that you every line is used on this one okay so then that's selling and then now we need administrative expenses so we've got some labels in now we will have another one when we get closer down there okay so now we're going to look at what would be selling expenses anything with the word sales anything with the word advertising anything about a store if we have delivery expense, it goes in. Anything that's miscellaneous. So if you go up here and look, after cost of goods sold, woo, they've put this in here nice. There's sales salaries, advertising expense, depreciation expense of the store, and miscellaneous. So one, two, three, four. There should be four. One, two, three, four. And then I think we get a total. So... Um, the first one is sales, salaries, expense. Okay, let's put that amount in. Sales, salaries, expense, 916000 And I left off a zero. So be sure that you double check your numbers. The next one is advertising expense. Advertising expense is 550000 the next one is 
Depreciation expense store equipment. I am going to go get this. Depreciation store equipment. Okay. Okay, it's right here. Depreciation store equipment. Copy and paste. And that amount is 140000 And then the next one is miscellaneous expense, miscellaneous selling expense. So once again, they're in order. It's nice that they did it this way. They just put the balance sheet on the top, miscellaneous selling expense. It's 38000 Okay. Okay, so this one then has total selling and then we'll have total admin. So let's go find total selling. It should be an amount description. So total selling expenses. Okay, so this is gonna be a calculation that we need to do. And we're gonna calculate this, this together as one amount. Okay, one amount. So that amount is 1 million. 644,000. Okay, now we're going to look at administrative expenses. Okay, so if we go up and look, because we've put in our sales, right? So office salaries expense, rent expense, depreciation, insurance, office supplies, and miscellaneous. Okay, so we're going to start with office salary expense. Okay, and that amount, office salaries expense is six hundred fifty thousand. The next one is rent expense. Okay, rent expense is ninety four thousand. Now we have a depreciation expense, but it's for office equipment. So office for office equipment, there it is. Copy and paste. Okay, that amount is 50000 Okay, now we want insurance. Insurance expense. Okay, I left off the E. Insurance expense is $48,000. Um, office supplies expense. Office supplies expense is $28,100. Right, $28,100. I got it right here and I forgot. $28,100. And then the last one is miscellaneous admin. Okay, miscellaneous admin. And I'm going to get that total up here so I don't have to type all that out. Okay, and then we see the amount there on the side. Okay, so it is... 14,500. Now we're ready to total our administrative expenses. So you should see total administrative expenses as a label. Put it in and all of these add up to 884,600. Okay, now we're ready to come in with a total that's called total operating expenses. Total operating expenses. And we're going to add these two numbers together. 2528600 Okay. Now we've got to subtract. Actually, um, we now have operating income operating income okay so your operating income is 964,400 we have one more account that gets a label this is called other revenue and expenses other revenue and expenses there it is it's a label and there's only one left the only one left is miss is interest expense. It's kind of out here by itself. 
So let's put that down, interest expense, and it is 21,000. Now we have to remember to subtract 21,000. We have to subtract from operating income and now we should have our net income. Net income. And it looks like we're going to have one. So the net income is 943,400. So this should be, if I keyed everything in okay, right? Sometimes you have to slow down to do it. So we got that. All right, now we're ready to put together our stockholders equity statement. Now we're going to need the net income. Okay, but we need to put the label in. So what does the label on a stockholder's equity statement need? It needs exactly the same one from the income statement. So we can just copy it and bring it down. Okay, now this one has a beginning balance and an ending balance. So let's go see if we can find an amount description up here beginning balance. So their beginning year, uh, of a year is June. Okay, so we're going to put this in. And I'm also going to put the, be, the ending in here. The ending. So the ending is May 31st of the year we're reporting. Okay, so put those two in before you get started. Now, we need to make sure we remember Let's go back and look. Common stock, okay? Common stock is right here. It's 500,000. That is the balance that's in there, okay? So let's put it in. Now, if you look, it says additional common stock of 75,000 was issued during the year ending May 31st. Okay, so when we look at a stockholder's equity statement, if they issued any extra, it gets listed here and then we find the beginning balance. Okay, so we're going to go find a label of or of issued common stock. Okay, issued common stock. There it is under amount descriptions. Okay, and we're going to put in the amount they said of 75000 and it stays in this column. The only thing that goes in this column is common stock. Now, if we know what it ended with, we know how much came in during the year, then we just simply subtract to get 425000 in common stock to begin with. Now, we can go over, we just put a zero there. Oh, I'm sorry, retained earnings does have a beginning balance. Let's find it. We can use the one on here, 2,949,100, okay, 2,949,100. Now we're gonna add a cross. When you add across, it's 3,374,100. You add across, common stock issued does not affect retained earnings, so it's simply 75,000. And now we're ready to put in our net income. Let's put net income. And net income does not affect common stock, but it does affect retained earnings. So you say, I don't even remember. Well, there it is, 943,400. 943,400. And that's what this total here should be. Last one is dividends. Okay, so if you look at this, right, we have all three of these for, uh, for the one we're working on too. So dividends actually come out of retained earnings and we're gonna put it in as a negative. Now we didn't put in any negatives up here on the income statement, but we will here. And you know that by looking at the instructions, 
use the minus sign to enter any deductions on here. So this should be dividends. The dividends are the last item before the income statement items begin. So it's 100,000. And then 100,000 gets recorded here. Now we add down. I'll do the addition. 3,792,500. And it should add this way and this way if we did it right. So 4,292,500 is what we have in this statement of stockholders equity. We need these pieces. We need these totals here, right here, to go to the balance sheet. Now I'm going to open up the balance sheet because we've had it hidden up to now. I think we can close. Let's close the income statement. We already know what it is, so let's get rid of it. And let's get rid of the instructions. We probably will need our labels, and we most definitely will need this stockholder's equity. So let's see. They have already put this put labels in here for us. So let's see on a balance sheet, what is the first equity that's reported is usually common stock. So let's put common stock in and the common stock amount from this one is 500,000. Okay, 500,000. Then we need Retained earnings, retained earnings, okay? This is the one that changes the most on that stockholder's equity statement, okay? Changes the most. So retained earnings is 3,792,500. I like to try to put these in, especially if it's like this, so that I remember why I went to all that trouble to go to put together the stockholders equity statement. Let me finish, I, I did this wrong. Just a minute, 3,792,500. I'm not used to dealing with those big a numbers. So now we only have two pieces to the stockholders equity section, look. So we're gonna go get total stockholders equity. That, so we can type it in, total stockholders equity and it's the apostrophe is after the s and we're going to add these two together and that should give us the total that we have here on that statement okay so here we go it's 4,292,500 now i'm going to put a label in so the bottom of a balance sheet should say total liabilities and stockholders equity. So there should be a label up here, total liabilities and stockholders equity. That's half of the balance sheet, okay? You can't always do income or balance sheets this way, but when you can, you might as well. Now we don't know what that is yet, okay? So here's what I wanna do next. Now I wanna go to the top of the balance sheet. Let's look at this balance sheet. This balance sheet has one day. That's different than for the year ended and for the year ended. So let's go see if we have just the one day in time. So there it is, May 31st, and that's what goes in for your balance sheet. Okay, I told you that they put these in in order. This is called financial statement order. So our first label on the balance sheet is current assets. So let's put our labels in, okay? Let's put our labels in. Current assets. Current assets are the assets you expect to use and, and cash in within the year, okay? After current assets, we need property, plant, and equipment. And you can go up and get it, property, plant, and equipment. Okay, so let's 
Okay, so I think that's right because I didn't get a red, I didn't get red there. We also need current liabilities. Okay, what else? Current liabilities, long-term liabilities. Let's put that one in, long-term liabilities. So just like current, anything current means it needs to be paid within the year. Current up here means we plan to use these assets during the year. I'm going to do liabilities first. Liabilities are usually a shorter list than assets, and that will get us one half of our balance sheet. So if you go look at the list, you'll see assets stop here and begin, liabilities begin with accounts payable. So I'm gonna start putting in accounts payable. Okay, accounts payable is 321,000. Okay, the next one is salaries payable for $41,500. Okay, um, and then the next one is customer refunds payable. I'm going to use my customer refunds payable. Oh, okay, so I've got to type these in now. That's all right. Customer refunds payable. Okay, it's total. Customer refunds payable is 40000 then we have estimated, where am I at? Sorry, estimated returns. Nope, I'm in liabilities, I'm sorry. Uh, estimated coupons payable. Estimated coupons payable, 5,000. Okay, so that, then should be, there should be one called total current liabilities. Now I'm going to make that list. I want to have the instructions again because I want to be able to use some of these. Okay, so we want total current asset. I'm sorry, total current liabilities. Forgot I'm still working on liabilities. We'll get there. I know this is very strenuous and long. Okay, so... The current asset, current liabilities, I still keep trying to say it, is 457500 Okay, just a minute. Let me make sure I have them all. Whoops, I did miss one. So total current liabilities, jump down one. Total current liabilities. Total current liabilities is going to go over here. So we need actually um, something. So we have this note payable. Okay. We have this note payable. Um, it says, assuming that the current portion of the note payable is $50,000. So if we have a long-term liability, there is a current portion of that. Okay, current portion. So let's see if it'll say current portion. Current portion. Current liability. No. Hold on. Let me see what we need. For this one, They, I think they have a, a label. So let's see. That's tough. Okay, that's tough. Oh, note payable, current portion. I would have never known what, what they labeled it. So be sure to go get your label so you're not so frustrated. Now we're ready for the current liability total. That is 457500 Okay.
Okay. All right, so now we're ready for our long-term liability. Let's put notes payable or note payable. And, okay, hold on. What is it with, that we have here? Note payable. Let's go see what they're calling it. Um, yes, I'm still here. It's hard to believe. Okay, uh, the account. Let's go up and see from our list. Okay, note payable, final payment due in six years. Okay, so note payable long-term portion. Note payable, let's see. I think we have it here. Note payable current portion. Wow. Um, okay. Hey, I've got note payable that they took it. And I'm going to go up here and get this and see if it takes it. All right. I don't know. We're going to try it. Sorry, this is, it doesn't like it. Let's see. Okay, that's fine. So we just took out 50,000 out of this 300,000, right? 50,000 of it sitting here. So this becomes 50,000. Woo! We're now ready for total liabilities. Total liabilities. Okay, so when you add your current plus your long-term, you get total liabilities of 707,500. You're gonna add down both the liabilities and the stockholders equity. Woo, 5 million is our, not 50 million, but 5 million is half of the balance sheet, okay? The bottom piece of this second half or the first half of the, 500,000, there are 500 million. This is total assets. So you can go ahead and put that in. Okay, so there it is. Now we're ready to march down the list here. Okay, so let's put cash in. Cash is 240,000. Accounts receivable. is 966,000. We have estimated, we have inventory. Okay, inventory is next. Like I said, they did you a good favor here, even though this is very long, 1,690,000. Then we have estimated returns inventory. Okay, it is 22,500. Then we have office supplies. Office supplies is 13,500. And then we have prepaid insurance. And I believe this is the last of the current assets. Prepaid insurance, 8,000. Now we need total current assets. And I'll give you the total. Okay, total current assets, 2,940,000. Okay, now we're ready for property, plant, and equipment. So we have office equipment and store equipment. Okay, so office equipment how much is it office equipment 830,000 now let's go get the accumulated depreciation okay the accumulated depreciation for that office equipment so we're going to go up here Accumulated depreciation office equipment. I don't feel like typing all that out. That's okay. 
We're going to put that in. And remember, this is the amount of that asset that's already been expensed. So now we want the book value of the office equipment. Book value. So we've got to list that so that we can communicate how much we have already expensed of that fixed asset. Okay, we're now ready for store equipment. We're almost done. Chewy, I know. 3,600,000. Accounting is not for the faint of heart. You have got to get, I cannot tell you how many nights I have spent up doing work. Okay, but it's just the way it goes. All right, we need another accumulated depreciation for the store equipment. There it is. Copy and put it in. All right, and its value is eight, I'm sorry, 1,820,000. And the book value of that store equipment is calculated on the balance sheet, okay? And that amount is 1,780,000. All right, so now we need a total for your long-term, no, total property, plant, and equipment. These are long-term assets, but the business world likes to call it total property, plant, and equipment. Okay, PPE for short. So we have this one last place to put this in right here. Yep. Total property, plant, and equipment. Well, you can solve for it already because you know that the total is $5 million, but I'll go ahead and give it to you. So it is $2 million. $60,000, $2,060,000. So when you add these two down, it should be 5 million. When you add current liabilities and long-term liabilities, there was only one. So it, they didn't do a total for that. So those two added together. Then you have to add the two equity accounts that we found from stockholders equity statement. Let's see if I'm ready to give this a test. I may have miskeyed something. Looks like something's wrong. So 57.13, here we are. The accumulated depreciation, I missed. Oh, I think I need to put this in as a negative, 550,000. And I put way too many. All right, there's that one. Now let's do this one as a negative. Sometimes they want it and sometimes they don't. So now let's try it. Okay, that was it. So when you put in your accumulated depreciation, please put in a negative. Now, let's see what the last question is. And then we're going to call it good. Okay, we're going to call it good. I appreciate your hard work. I appreciate hanging in there. Let's go to the final question. The last question is, which type of income statement <laughs> shows intermediate balances? So if you look at the income statement up here that we have now hidden, let's look at it. So it's got several spots. Here's, here's a subtotal. Here's a subtotal, here's a subtotal, here's one, right? So quite a few intermediate balances. And so there you go. That one was easy to do. That's it, folks. That's all that we're going to work on for. And oh, no, you have three others. Sorry, sorry. You have one that, let's just look at it real quick. Purchase related transactions. So be sure to look at this in your book. Purchase related transactions on the side. 
And we did some already up here in one and two. So I would go look at those. Here are some sales related transactions using credit cards. Well, credit cards are easy because they're considered cash. You say, why? Why are they cash? Well, the credit card company is going to send us the money that their customers are using their credit card with. So if somebody pays for something from a business with a credit card, um, that customer doesn't owe the business. The business gets their money from the credit card company, and then the customer owes the credit card company. So whatever you see as purchasing on a visa or a credit card, you just record it to cash, okay? So these should be all cash sales. Don't forget, there's two entries to every sale when it comes to perpetual inventory, and that makes the inventory go down, and that's what cost of goods sold is inventory going down. It's also the cost of goods sold that gets debited. The last one is the income statement. So if you look at this income statement that we've been looking at all along, sheesh, putting it together, it was so long. I know, here it is. What's the amount of gross profit? So what do you gotta remember? You gotta remember that sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. So I'm gonna let you try to work on this um, and see if you can't find the answers. You can check your work as much as you want, but I am tired, okay? So I'm gonna say goodbye for now and post this video. Hang in there. We're, we're getting close to being about halfway done, so hang in there.